Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Ann Smith, co-chair of the Club's Arts Forum and your program organizer for today. It's my pleasure to extend a special welcome to any new club members who are watching. We know you'll enjoy your membership and we look forward to seeing you often. And we also want to welcome our listening audience and we invite everyone to visit us online at Commonwealth Club. Dot org. I'm delighted at this meeting to welcome San Francisco born and based educator, performer, composer, and conductor Cole Thomason Reedus as our speaker for today. His topic, Love Has Made Them One, exploring the romance of Benjamin Britten and Peter Pears, a special for Pride Week. Cole has spent over a quarter century serving the music industry in many uh, diverse ways. He's got a vast array of skill sets, but currently he is the educational content curator in the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Community at the San Francisco Opera, where he's host of the weekly online series, Opera Aficionado. Cole is also the upper division director of the Marin Girls Chorus and the associate conductor of the National Children's Chorus. Always a teacher at heart, Cole was the director of education for the Grammy Award winning vocal ensemble, our very own Chanticleer, after having served a seven year tenure as curator of classical music at Apple Incorporated, and three years as a classical musical analyst for the Music Genome Project at Pandora Media. He's taught at uh, the San Francisco School of the Arts. He's been with, uh, taught with the San Francisco Boys Chorus, Ragazzi Boys Chorus and the San Francisco Arts Education Project. Has sung in many performances and recordings with the numerous ensembles and has been, um, he's also a solo singer and a, an entertainer uh, from uh, vocal arts songs to uh, one-man shows dealing with the American Songbook, and he's a graduate in music composition from the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Well, if you have questions during Cole's presentation, uh, we'll gather them uh, for Core to respond to. There should be time for Q&A during the last 10 minutes of this program. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Cole Thomas and Rita's our speaker for Love Has Made Them One, exploring the romance of Benjamin Britten and Peter Pierce. Thank you so much, Anne. It's an honor to be here today. And thank you to you and your friend, Carol Fleming, for arranging my appearance today. And thank you all so much for joining us as we close National Pride Month for Love Has Made Them One, exploring the romance of Benjamin Britten and Peter Pierce. We are gathered here today to celebrate the union of a very cool couple, I'm no expert on the composer Benjamin Britten, but after a lifetime, or hopefully at least half a lifetime, of singing his music, I've only more recently gotten to know the story of him and his beloved Peter Piers. And that is the story I'd like to share with you today. So with that, let me share my screen and we will dive down the aisle. My darling man, off to the post. I hadn't realized it went so early, so this can be only a scribble to say how your letters have been life and breath to me. My darling, to think I have been so selfish as to make you unhappy when you have so much strain and such hard work to bear. But I too have come out of this weekend a better person. 
I seem to be getting things into order a bit. Again, it seems to be a matter of, oh man, know thyself, and of knowing what I really want, and living that knowledge. I promise, my darling. It is lovely being here. You must come soon and consummate it. Meantime, I live for Friday and you, my man, my beloved man, B. Benjamin Britten was born on St. Cecilia's Day, November 22nd, 1913, in the English sea town, the English North Sea town of Lustof Suffolk. In a time and place where class distinctions were very much still a thing, he described his family as a very ordinary middle class. And I see that my slides are getting ahead of me here. So we're just going to leave that there for the moment and we'll get to Mitz when it's doing momentarily. Uh, let me start that sentence again. In a time and place where class distinctions were still very much a thing, he described his family as very ordinary middle class. His father, Robert, was a failed farmer turned dentist and an agnostic who refused to attend Sunday services. His mother, Edith, was the child of an illegitimate father and an alcoholic mother. Very ordinary middle class indeed. Benjamin's first music teacher was his mother, something he and I have in common. Edith was an amateur musician and served as secretary of the Lustof Musical Society. She taught him piano and notation and regularly invited pillars of the community to enjoy live performances at their in-house soirees. This was Benjamin's only exposure to music at the time and that his father forbade the presence of a gramophone or lady, later a radio. In fact, he was one of the very last Western composers to be brought up exclusively on live music and live storytelling. I think this says a lot about his compositional style. So much of his work is filled with the sounds of his everyday life in a modernizing world. His music incorporates and borrows heavily from traditional British folk music. His vocal writing is heavily influenced by the natural speech rhythms of the text he is setting, while retaining the passionate lyricism and sometimes haunting beauty of the popular ballads he would have heard in his youth. His dramatic works strive to hold drama and emotion as the key considerations for the music that accompanies. He consistently creates a narrative that allows the listener to follow a story. In his own words, my music has its roots in where I live and work. What a perfect composer for opera. That's just one of my biases. <laughs> Meanwhile, his harmonies display a solid academic training amidst a rebellious nature of juxtaposing tonalities and timbres. These factors are a perfect storm for some glorious and dramatic moments in music. These factors also mean that not all of Benjamin's music is pretty. I dare say some of it is even ugly, purposefully and unapologetically. As an example, here is an excerpt from his 1960 opera, A Midsummer Night's Dream. In this scene, Oberon, King of the Fairies, and his queen Titania are having an epic argument that literally alters the forces of nature.
So now if I didn't know about the splendors that are to come in that opera, and that is what I heard in the first 10 minutes, I don't know how eager I'd be to stay. But imagine that scene with a more beautiful or even just a more traditional score. It simply wouldn't tell the story in the same way. I use this opera as my first example because it is my favorite work of Britain. That is undoubtedly because I was in a production of this work at San Francisco Opera in 1992. I was 13 and I played the role of Peas Blossom, a fairy. And here comes a photo of that. There I am um, on the left-hand side in what is a pink costume. I'm not sure how well the pink color is coming in there. But as you can imagine, every 13-year-old boy dreams to be dressed in roughly pink. Um, now, I'm curious as to what your favorite works of Benjamin Britten are. Um, I had such a robust experience with the Mid-Semantic Dream that it just is ingrained in me. And I feel that people that love Britain, uh, they tend to really um, love the piece that they heard first, whatever their first experience was with Britain. Later on in our question and answer time, I hope that I can hear from some of you about what your favorite works of Britain are. Moving on though, or should I say back, three years and five months earlier before the birth of Britain, Peter Piers was born on June 22nd, 1910. Born in Farnham, Surrey in the south of England, he was one of seven children. His father was a Quaker and worked as a civil engineer. Both Peter and Benjamin attended schools in their hometowns and both excelled early in their musical studies while showing a lack of enthusiasm for more academic subjects, also something I have in common with them. Both men were able sportsmen and avid cricket players. They both enjoyed ordinary childhoods in a united kingdom that was rapidly changing. What's interesting about these men being born into middle-class society at this time is to then witness their astonishing rise in musical, social, and even royal society. While the middle class claimed a bit of their own pride in the Victorian and Edwardian eras, it was specifically during the childhoods of Benjamin and Peter that their eventual place in society became even remotely possible. And of course, they both had one very big thing in common. They were gay. Now let's consider what it was to be a gay man in Britain at this time. Homosexuality became somewhat popular and almost tolerated in early 20th century Britain. By around 1910, they had established their own social circles and somewhat hidden communities. They met in pubs and coffee houses. A section of the Lions Corner House in Piccadilly Circus even had a section reserved for their, their kind known as the Lily Pond. In 1912, the first London gay pub, Madame Stringberg's The Cave of the Golden Calf, opened off Regent Street. And yet, homosexual acts of any kind had been explicitly forbidden and punishable by royal law since 1533. As an example of how unforgiving this law was, I ask you to recall Alan Turing. Turing was a brilliant scientist whose newfangled invention, essentially the first computer, cracked the Enigma code used by the Nazis, enabling Britain and the Allied forces to achieve victory in World War II. Now you'd think such a man would be given a parade and awarded a lordship. This was not the case, however, and in 1952, he was convicted of indecent acts and given the choice of imprisonment or chemical castration. Turing chose the latter, the side, effect, of side effects of which led him to commit suicide in 1954 at the age of 41, just a year younger than I am now. So for Benjamin and Peter, their eventual choice to embrace love would put them in grave danger, both socially and legally, very brave and not so ordinary. But first, our Romeo and Julio must meet. They first met in 1934. Benjamin was new to London, but was already making a mark as an exciting up and coming young composer. 
Peter at this time was a member of the BBC Singers. It was this choir that premiered the composer's A Boy Was Born. And it was this composition that first brought him success and notoriety. Let's have a brief listen. For the first few years, they were, more, they were mere acquaintances. It was not until the death of a close mutual friend in 1937 that they began spending more time together, clearing out the deceased's cottage. Benjamin immediately began composing for Peter, and in that same year, they presented their first of many joint recitals. Also in that year, Benjamin's mother died. It is said that this death, though very traumatic, allowed him to explore his sexuality more openly and pursue serious relationships with other gay men. Benjamin had found his muse and their partnership began to transform from artistic and platonic to one of love and romance. Interesting to note that up until now, Peter had yet to decide whether to focus on his singing or his performing at the piano. He was skilled and talented at both, yet it was Benjamin that convinced him to concentrate solely on voice. Benjamin was enraptured by Peter's voice. Benjamin's own words in a letter from 1949 boast that Peter is potentially the greatest singer alive. Now let's focus on that comment for a moment. The funny thing about Peter's voice is that it was ruthlessly reviled by many a critic, but has clearly also been loved and celebrated to this day. Let's have a listen and see what you think. Here we have a short movement from Britain's song cycle, Seven Sonnets of Michelangelo which he wrote for him and Peter in 1940. <laughs> Lasso più morir mi doia, salte pur di morir, salte pur di morir. Dunque per queste luce l'ore del fin fian ben molesta, con gli altro ben val men, con gli ben con gli mi doia. Però se il conto che un ruben volo, schifar non posso, almen se destinato, chi entra la fra la doce e dolo. Se vinte presi debbe ser beato, maraviglia non è se nude solo, resta pigiando il cavaliere amato, resta pigiando il cavaliere amato.
And there we have the voice of Peter Piers. And I'm curious, after hearing that, and um, as well as other selections we'll hear throughout the talk, I'd love to hear from you guys what you think of Peter Piers' voice. Uh, so perhaps we'll have time for comments on that in the chat window later on. Um, hopefully, many of you love it. Um, some of you might find it interesting. Others might think, whoa, well, won't someone please stop that man from singing? Um, there's a variety of opinions on his voice. And a critic, David Cairns, wrote, his voice was not beautiful in itself. Its reedy timbre was so idiosyncratic that for some people, it came between them and the music. Even his countless admirers might have agreed that, objectively considered, it lacked warmth and variety of color. But so great was his skill and so subtle and imaginative his musical sensitivity and mastery of inflection that it conveyed, together with his air of patrician authority and extraordinary richness of atmosphere and feeling. And now we have another letter from Benjamin Britain to Peter Piers. My dear Pete, isn't everything bloody? Just as one was allowing oneself to get too hopeful too. However, I don't think anyone can really trust Hitler anymore. Although Neville Chamberlain will have a good shot at it before he's turned out of power. Much love, Benji. Haunting words we have there. And we of course now know that Hitler could indeed not be trusted and that Chamberlain would miss his shot. For Benjamin and Peter, along with so many others, the signs of impending war in Europe were deeply troubling. Both men were devout pacifists. For Peter, it is thought that his father's Quaker background had the largest influence on his pacifist ideals. For Benjamin, he would later remark that it was the regimented, disciplined, and punitive practices of his childhood headmasters that drove him to despise all forms of inhumane treatment against his fellow man, a subject he would explore in so many of his works. He was quoted as saying, a subject very close to my heart, the struggle of the individual against the masses. The more vicious the society, the more vicious the individual. These sentiments, along with a slew of bad reviews in the British press regarding Benjamin's recent works and the current success in America of his former teacher, composer Frank Bridge, led the couple to leave Britain behind and seek a new opportunity in America. They were in good company there as their close friends, W.H. Auden and Christopher Isherwood, had also recently made the hop across the pond. It was during this period that Benjamin and Peter's relationship and their commitment to each other truly solidified. They were now partners and companions in every respect. Love had made them one. As war in Europe became official, Benjamin and Peter consulted the embassy in Washington. They were advised to remain in the US as artistic ambassadors. They were both deeply torn, yet ultimately decided to stay put on foreign and still peaceful ground. While in America, Benjamin's compositional output was prolific and strong, including his seven sonnets of Michelangelo, his violin concerto, and his first dramatic work, the operetta Paul Bunyan. Not quite a story you'd expect from a Brit, but when in Rome, or at least New York. Sadly, however, the US critics soon showed no more friendliness towards Benjamin than those at home. Peter's unique voice was met with equal displeasure. Meanwhile, Peter bought a copy of The Burrow, a collection of narrative poems by the English poet, George Crabbe. He shared it with Benjamin and suggested that the poem about a fisherman named Peter Grimes might make for a wonderful opera. Besides inspiring in Benjamin what was to become his most significant and applauded work thus far, the poem, set in Suffolk near the composer's home, also brought forth deep nostalgia. He later said, I, certain, I suddenly realized where I belonged and what I lacked. The two set sail for home in early April of 1942. It was not an easy nor pleasant journey. After sneaking up along the eastern coast of North America, their ship headed east for a 12 day journey across the wide Atlantic with a constant threat of encountering German submarines loomed like suffocating London fog. The ship was apparently consumed with obnoxious noises of all sorts and the company on board, according to Peter, was rather desolate. While Peter complained further that he was unable to practice anywhere on the ship, Benjamin's time was remarkably productive. 
So within these two weeks, he completed his Hymn to St. Cecilia and Ceremony of Carols, both of which remain as some of his most widely and frequently performed and recorded choral works. On April 17th, 1942, the couple arrived home to a very different Britain. Air raids and bombings were regular occurrences. Restrictions and rations made for a dismal quality of life for most Londoners, while propaganda posters encouraged all to maintain courage, cheerfulness, and resolution. Complicating things further, as fit British males, Benjamin and Peter were required by law and expected by society to fight for king and country. While their applications for conscientious objector status were eventually approved, the British people, and more specifically, the British musicians, did not look kindly upon those deemed as cowards and deserters for having fled to America at first signs of war. Concert engagements were scarce for their first few months back home. In September of 1942, the two premiered Benjamin's Michelangelo song cycle at Wigmore Hall with a subsequent recording released in February of 1943. The experience of this performance cemented Benjamin's obsession with what he referred to as Peter's heavenly voice. He would next compose another cycle for Peter, his celebrated serenade for tenor, horn, and strings. And even went as far as to request that an earlier work for soprano, Les Illuminations, no longer be performed by sopranos. A letter from Peter to Benjamin, November 1942. My beloved darling, my little pussycat, this is really only to tell you, probably all in vain because you won't get it and you'll leave just as the post arrives, that I love you and miss you terribly. Every loving couple I see, I envy. I go to the movies and weep buckets because every situation I translate to our own personal one. Oh, I do hope we'll never be in quite such a dilemma as Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman get themselves into in Casablanca. Promise me that you won't leave me just as the Nazis enter London because you hear your husband isn't dead after all, and then turn up with him at the speakeasy I'm running in Newfoundland, trying to forget you. Promise me you won't, will you? For one thing, I'm sure I should never behave as nobly as Bogart does be. Look, I've got to rehearse a little while here on Friday morning, 10.30, 11.30 or so, so I shan't be back in town until the afternoon. See you then. Love, 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 P. This became a successful time for Peter, who had, uh, who had joined the Sadler Wells Opera Company and was touring constantly throughout the United Kingdom, singing role, leading roles in the Magic Flute, Cosi Fan Tutte, Rigoletto, and La Boheme, among many others. As Peter gained experience and stature, his strengthening abilities altered the course of Benjamin's current project, the opera Peter Grimes. No longer would the title character be a villainous baritone, but instead, a tortured and misunderstood outsider with the voice of an angelic tenor. The opera was premiered at the reopening of Sadler Wells in London on June 7th, 1945. Peter Grimes was met with wild acclaim by critics and audiences alike. The opera administrator at Sadler's Wells remarked that it was the first genuinely successful British opera since Purcell. And at the box office, this very modern and very British opera had outsold both La Boheme and Madame Butterfly if only every opera company had that problem. However, this new work was not loved by all. Members of the company referred to the score as a cacophony and presented a number of other complaints that today would be classified as homophobic. Nevertheless, two stars had been born and they no longer needed the patronage nor employment of a reputable company. Along with singer and artistic director of Sadler's Wells, Joan Cross, they set out to establish a new opera company that would later become known as the English Opera Group. This new company soon premiered Benjamin's next two operas, The Rape of Lucretia and Albert Herring. Both works featured Peter. These years began a golden era for these two men, these partners, and their astonishing careers.
A letter from Peter to Benjamin, October 1951. Honeybee, I'm longing to be back again with you. This is the last time I shall be abroad for three months. Isn't that wonderful? No doubt I shall be very glad to go to Switzerland at the end of January, but until then, give me England. Very much love to you, my old huggable honey bear, your devoted old mate, P. And now I have a fun little trivia question for you all. Which of the following was not a salutation penned by Britain or peers? Uh, your choices are A, a bunch of blue ribbons, B, two as Petrus, C, dear sir, D, my most beautiful of all little blue gray mouse catching pearly bottomed creamy thighed soft waisted mewing rat pursuers. Uh, so out of those choices, everyone, which one do you think was not actually written in a letter by one of these two guys? No need to answer out loud. You can just think the answer to yourself. And the correct answer is Chuis Petrus, which of course is from the sacred Latin liturgical text, Thou art Peter, thou art the rock of my church. Um, so my, my bunch of blue ribbons, dear sir, and that extremely other long sentence were actually written in letters. And here we have a letter from Peter to Benjamin. And that is starting. We'll hear that first. This is Schubert.
So lovely. Um, and now back to, uh, by the way, so that was Peter Pierce singing with Benjamin Britten at the piano performing Schubert. And now back to the letter I was about to share with you before that music ran away with itself. Uh, this is a letter from Peter to Benjamin dated November, 1948. Dear sir, I, the undersigned would like to know why I have not received any communication written for 82 hours. I would respectfully suggest that denotes a total lack of interest in the undersigned and that it is no, uh, not a particular amiable way of behaving be, do you see? I have half a mind to stop this letter at once. What struck me when reading all 350 of their published letters was to realize how much their relationship thus far was spent away from each other. I also relate to that and that my boyfriend is a countertenor and spends half the year traveling the world with the internationally renowned ensemble Chanticleer and he travels the world without me. <laughs> Hopefully our texts to each other won't end up in a book someday. Um, and of course, this last year, there have been no tours, there have been no concerts. And so for the first time we've actually been together and it's been wonderful, but now as the world opens back up, concerts are beginning again and Shannon goes back on tour. Just a nice little ad for them. Uh, concerts and premieres in London and abroad, grueling tours of one show or another, festivals around the world, all these common aspects of their careers meant that they were rarely in the same place at the same time for very long. Adding to that, the criminality of their coupled being meant it was often not a good idea for them to even reside in the same home. In 1947, Peter had the idea that they could start their own festival, an annual summer festival for which the greatest musicians of the day would come to them. For the festival's location, they chose the small Suffolk seaside town of Aldeburgh, where Benjamin owned a small home. Founded along with their friend, librettist and producer Eric Crozier, the Aldeburgh Festival debuted over eight days in June 1948. The diverse programming included Benjamin's opera Albert Herring, his new cantata St. Nicholas, and performances by pianist Clifford Curzon and the Zorian String Quartet. The festival was immediately successful and quickly grew over the coming years, eventually occupying several venues in the town. Throughout these next years, Benjamin's compositional output was prolific and masterful. His Spring Symphony, Turn of the Screw, Noya's Flood, A Midsummer's Dream, and The Haunting War Requiem are some of the most notable works of this golden age and of his lifetime. In 1951, he wrote the opera Billy Budd, based on the E.M. Forrester novel with a libretto by Eric Crozier. In this monumental work, Benjamin deeply and thoughtfully explores the themes of homosexuality, insecurity, intolerance, and homophobia, set amidst a warship at sea filled with a cast of only men and boys. One of those men on stage was, of course, Peter Pierce. Peter's performance calendar was never light, he continued to command stages at the finest houses in repertoire ranging from early music to the standard greats such as La Traviata. 
Music of his engagements included, sorry, much of his engagements included subsequent productions of the roles created for him by Benjamin. On the smaller stage, performing together was something they cherished as a way to stay together. They became noted not just for the recitals and recordings of Benjamin's song cycles and arrangements of British folk songs, but also for their joint interpretations of standard repertoire such as Schubert Leader. In so many ways, it was a happy and successful time for them both. All their success and happiness was grossly overshadowed from time to time by the never ending scrutiny they faced as gay men. While the couple never hid the relationship, they never flaunted it or their sexuality. They believed that should that this, excuse me, they believed that should be enough to leave two gentlemen alone. As Benjamin put it, why shouldn't I be myself? In mid 20th century Britain, this of course was not the case. In 1953, Benjamin was visited by the police who were investigating reports of lewd behavior. While nothing came of it, this episode greatly upset Benjamin. Here they were being outcast amidst their attempts to be so very ordinary. For some time, he even considered convincing Peter to enter into an arranged marriage. This never happened and I can only imagine Peter would have simply said no. Amidst all this, their stars continued to rise. In that same year, Benjamin's opera, Gloriana, was premiered as part of the official event celebrating the coronation of Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. As Benjamin and Peter rose to new heights in their careers, so too grew their beloved summer festival, and they soon found themselves having to make programming decisions based on technical and logistical capability. No venue in town yielded the capacity for large-scale performances. Luckily, a series of malt houses became available in the neighboring village of Snape. Work began on a new concert hall that would welcome the largest orchestras in Europe and the most complex of dramatic stage productions from renowned companies. This new venue and the 20th, 20th consecutive Aldebra Festival were opened by their dear friend, the Queen, on June 2nd, 1967. And that's the image that you see here. We have Queen Elizabeth with Benjamin Britten and behind them to the left, we see the late Duke of Edinburgh and Peter Pierce. What's so interesting about this image here is what it says about their status as a couple. At any state visit, it would be customary for the queen to accompany the host, in this case, Benjamin Britten, and it would be also customary for her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, to accompany the spouse of the host. So here we see uh, Prince Philip, along with Peter Piers. And again, this to me really signifies that they, while they were not out as a couple, were very much understood to be one and, and accepted as one. In July of 1967, the House of Parliament approved the Sexual Offenses Act. It legalized homosexual acts on the condition that they were consensual, in private, and between two men who had attained the age of 21. Mind you, that private meant you had to be in your own home and the door had to be locked. Even the presence of a flatmate in another room could disqualify your location as private. This was in no way a full decriminalization, but for the first time in their lives, these two men could finally be together in their home without the constant fear of a knock at the door. Where they called home these days was a charming farmhouse in Aldera named the Red House, which Benjamin had purchased in 1957 it was here that Benjamin and Peter would live together for the second half of their almost 40 year span as a very modern couple. And yet many things about these two were not modern at all. Both men were commonly described as having the look and mannerisms of a beloved old schoolmaster. They were the type of English gentleman that was already then a dying breed. Like any ordinary Englander, the two took pride in their garden, spoiled their beloved dachshunds, and within the Red House, they nested a home that would outlast their love. Their later years together were in no way a time of retirement, however. Peter continued to follow a demanding performance schedule that often required his absence from Aldebaran. Benjamin continued to compose regularly, though he himself noticed a slowing of his abilities and an increased need for energy that he had not found necessary in his more youthful years. In 1970, Benjamin began work on his last opera, Death in Venice. 
The creation of this work would test the composer's abilities physically and emotionally. In 1972, while still completing the score, doctors informed Benjamin that his heart was not in good working order and that surgery was the only option. Always one to keep calm and carry on, Benjamin insisted that, the, that he first complete his opera. In June of 1973, the same month as the premiere of Death in Venice, he underwent surgery to replace a failing heart valve. While it was successful, it led to a stroke that prohibited Benjamin from ever again accompanying his muse at the piano and made the act of composing all the more difficult and trying. As you can imagine, this was horrible for Benjamin. For Peter, he realized he was witnessing the wilting of his favorite English rose. Peter went off to New York to perform the US premiere of Venice while Benjamin was left behind as he was too weak for travel. In June of 1976, Benjamin became the first composer to have bestowed upon him a life peerage. He was now Baron Britain of Aldeburgh in the County of Suffolk. Five months later, on the composer's 63rd birthday, a party was held at the Red House. The dearest and nearest of Benjamin Peter's friends and family gathered for champagne at a celebration they all knew was instead a goodbye. Two weeks later, on December 4th, 1976, Benjamin left this world and his beloved Peter. News of the composer's death was deeply felt throughout Britain and throughout the entire classical musical world. As an example of just how beloved and prominent this ordinary middle-class man had become, prior to his death, he was offered a burial space in Westminster Cathedral. This honor was refused, however, with the strict instructions that he was to be buried in the Aldebar churchyard. 10 years later, in April of 1986, Benjamin was reunited in that ash grove with his muse, his soulmate, his quaint spirit, his gentle Pete. A further and equally moving example of the place these two held in society is a letter of condolence sent to Peter from Her Majesty the Queen following Benjamin's passing. In this letter, her words are personal, heartfelt, and not unlike that which would be sent to any other grieving spouse. In 1978, Peter was knighted by Her Majesty and he became Sir Peter Peters, commander of the Order of the British Empire. Very ordinary indeed. A letter from Benjamin to Peter, November, 1974. My darling heart, perhaps an unfortunate phrase, but I can't use any other. I feel I must write a squiggle, which I couldn't say on the telephone without bursting into those silly tears. I do love you so terribly, and not only glorious you, but your singing. I've just listened to a rebroadcast of Winter Words, and honestly, you are the greatest artist that ever was. Every nuance, subtle and never overdone, those great words, so sad and wise, painted for one, that heavenly sound you make, full but always colored for words and music. What have I done to deserve such an artist and man to write for? I had to switch off before the folk songs because I couldn't anything after. How long, how long, how long? Only until December 20th. I think I can just bear it. But I love you, I love you, I love you. A letter from Peter to Benjamin four days later. My dearest darling, no one has ever had a lovelier letter than the one which came from you today. You say things which turn my heart over with love and pride, and I love you for every single word you write. But you know love is blind, and what your dear eyes do not see is that it is you who have given me everything right from the beginning from yourself in Grand Rapids. Through Grimes and Serenade and Michelangelo and Canticles, one thing after another, right up to this great Venice. I am here as your mouthpiece and I live in your music. And I can never be thankful enough to you and to fate for all the heavenly joy we have had together for 35 years. My darling, I love you, Peter.
These two are not two. Love has made them one. Amo ergo sum. And by its mystery, each is no less but more. And with that end, we are at the end of Love Has Made Them One, Exploring the Romance of Benjamin Britten and Peter Pierce. Thank you so much. Very, very uh, touching and moving. Um, we had a couple couple questions or comments and comments. <clears throat> I had one technical question. Yeah. Is there a description for the type of tenor voice that Pierce had? Not lyric, but... That 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 what? <laughs> yeah, that is such a great question, and it's a, it's a very interesting question because these days, it, you know, historically there are tons of different terms that can be used to describe very specific voice types, and that practice is a little bit out of fashion these days, but it is still used. Um, honestly, though, I have to say I'm not actually <laughs> sure which of those terms <laughs> applies to Peter. I really feel that he's um, almost his own voice, almost one that can't be linked to others. Yeah, it's quite unique. Quite unique. Absolutely. And what do you think of his voice, Anne? Well, I th I thought his voice is beautiful, but like, I couldn't, I couldn't find, I couldn't pin it. it it's um, it's not, it's not lyric really, mm -hmm. sort of at times, um, and it's very um, e expressive. I could imagine him on Broadway, <laughs> but. Um, that's why I said, is there a description for this, this voice? Expressive, yes, but also dramatic in, and um, uh, it's a reading almost of, at times. Absolutely, of, the words are really at the heart of what he sings. And like I said earlier, that is true for how Benjamin composed as well. So it really was a, a match made in heaven or luckily on earth. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> Well, I, I'll look forward to hearing more. A couple of, let's see, another question was, um, do you know if, if the fate of Alan Turing had any impact on um, uh, Britain pairs and their relationship? You know, I don't know for sure, but I don't think so. Um, okay. For one, Alan Turing himself was extremely private and everything that he had done for the war was kept absolutely classified and secret for until just recently actually um so they would not have necessarily known at the time who alan turing was what he was famous for or later famous for or you know the legal issues that he had had okay and uh, from daniel fergus tamaloris someone you know maybe i heard Piers sing death in venice at the met at its u.s premiere oh wow he says I appreciate the critical comments, but his voice remains for me haunting, unique, deeply beautiful. Thank you for that comment, Daniel. And I absolutely agree with you. Haunting, yeah. unique, and deeply beautiful. And wow, you were you were there for the US premiere. I'm so jealous of that. And I would love to hear more about that from you sometime. We'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> and then our, our friend Carol Fleming said, I have a soft spot in my heart for Rejoice in the, in the Lamb. Full disclosure, I once sang the solo. For the mouse is a creature of great personal valor. Got 35 bucks for it, too. <laughs> anyway, I wish I'd heard that, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to ask her if she has a recording somewhere. I will. I'm wondering if I even saw that. Carol and my father um, performed um, a lot together, I believe, in my, my early childhood. Or perhaps she was already on the board of that choir by then. Uh, but it's possible. Um, and Rejoice in the Lamb, what a great and unusual work that is. It's basically a cantata um, with choral movements, solos. Um, it is through composed. There are no breaks in between the movements. It's very fluid um, and some really peculiar and cool and playful things in it and some absolute beauty as well. And some hard solos. <laughs> so <you're Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think I think that, that, that wraps up a couple of our our comments here. And so I just wanted to uh, close by thanking you again so much for it's it's a, it's been an illuminating and incredibly thoughtful presentation. 
And I just wanted to let people know that if they want to hear more of CORE's always illuminating and always thoughtful presentations, they should tune in. Um, go to the Opera website on Sundays at 1 o'clock for Opera Aficionado, and you can hear more of this wonderful research and, and really uh, delightful uh, presentation work that he does. So thank, thank you so you. much for that, Anne. And yes, Opera Aficionado is every Sunday at one o'clock on Zoom, and you can go to sfopera.com slash aficionado for info on that. And Anne, there was actually one more musical example that I accidentally skipped at the very end. I wonder if we have a few minutes to share we that. Do, awesome. We do indeed. And okay, we, wonderful. You can go out to that and I'll say thank you to our audiences as well as those the, that may be listening later. And um, and then I'll adjourn this meeting uh, of the Commonwealth Club on the music after the music sounds. Light. Thomas and Reedus, Benjamin Britton, Peter Pierce, thank you so much for this lovely program. Love has made them one. <laughs>